Welcome, welcome to panel two. Cultural clout, the iBuyer cult. <clears throat> I'll just introduce uh, the speakers and moderator to you and they'll take it from here, there. There is a fine line between jewelry and watchmaking, but it is an apparent one. Barbara Palumbo has managed to grapple the reins of both horses with finesse. Creator and editor of What's on Her Wrist, Tell us, Barbara, what is on your wrist? Uh, Frédéric Constant. I couldn't help myself with match. that one. Thank you. Thanks. OK, sorry. I interrupted you as you were answering. No, 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 Frédéric Constant. I'm nice. sorry. OK. Peter I went for fashion. Oh. Yeah. It is a quartz. Don't kill me. Sorry. <laughs> he came, he saw, he created a watch brand in his name, he conquered. Peter emerged from the world of watchmaking and promptly opened a platform giving access to the intellectual nitty gritty, also referred to as the naked watchmaker. Let's hope no one angers him lest naked takes on a more literal meaning on his expose site. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Is this the roast? <laughs> A living, breathing representative of the best of what the world has to offer, Fiona, as a world citizen, gathered her findings and channeled her artistic zeal and created Fiona Kruger, Kruger timepieces, thus garnering the attention of the man, GPHG. By the startling age of 22, Dario Spallone has managed to create watch brand D1 Milano and implement its presence worldwide using methods that hit consumers with arrow-like precision. With Cupid's savvy aim, Dario's ideal of watch made, match is made in heaven. This applies to his ethos with teamwork and vision for his brand. A fixture in the watch industry and chief strategy and business development officer at Sadiqi Holding, Christophe Nices is a shark. He never stops moving. He has an eye for entities that have what it takes, and while this goes for brands across all sectors of an array of industries, he's here to talk about his first love, watches. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I would like to start off with a joke. Uh, a Frenchman, an Italian, a Scot, an Englishman, and an American walk into a Christie's. Yeah. Uh, I love the diversity of this panel and, and where we're all from. Um, my name is Barbara Palumbo, as I was just introduced, and I'm going to kind of delve right into this topic because uh, we touched on a few of these questions that we're going to cover today, uh, actually at the end of Suzanne's uh, panel. Uh, both questions that she had asked and then questions that came in from the audience, was, which is really like e-commerce, internet buyers, internet dilettantes, watch forums, youth, millennials, Gen Z, how we market to them, how we sell to them. So we're going to sort of cover those topics and more. Um, I'm going to go from here. With the World Wide Web on the eve of its 30th birthday, Right, there you go. And uh, web-based watch forums like timezone.com being 23 years old uh, and Purist Pro starting over 16 years ago. Uh, Self-proclaimed watch experts have been around long enough to not only be considered the norm, but to also have caused shifts in buying habits through their influence and their following. So my first question is gonna go to Fiona, uh, who's recently released a new watch, the Chaos Mechanical Entropy, which has already been reviewed by several uh, reputable online watch publications. And you're going to hear me say that term. So I may just call them RALPs at this point. <laughs> reputable online watch publications. Uh, being that your collections stem from personal experiences in your life, things that you've done, travels, you know, places you've been to, um, and that your designs largely focus on artistry and creativity, do you find that some in the digital community don't really understand your watches and have you had experiences with either commenters on, on posts or, again, the, the watch world dilettantes, the, the self-proclaimed experts, who likely have not seen your watches in person, um, you know, publicly criticizing them? Yeah. Um, well, I'll take those sort of one bit at a time. If okay. I go off piece and waffle, just give me a. I will. I'll um, so 
part of my, um, or I would say the core of my approach when I'm designing the watches that I design is that actually the inspiration um, starts off from a universally uh, relevant theme, right? So it's always linked to time, but it's a concept that everybody can relate to, and that's really important to me, not being from the watch industry, that it's something that you could look at and just react to it um, like an artwork. So the first collection was about time and mortality, the skull symbol you recognize, whether you're into watches um, from the back end of nowhere, from Mexico. Um, same thing with the chaos collection, the archetypal um, image of an explosion was a way to kind of get into that. So the, the language I use or the design way is very personal, but the core of the collections is something that's universal. Uh, which is quite important. And so it does mean that everybody can relate to them, which does mean that everybody can react to them, both good and bad. Um, so when you say about, uh, you know, do people online sometimes not understand your watches? That's not just limited to people online, <laughs> you know? I mean, sure. people, when they see them in the real, sometimes you get the, really the mix of, God, that's brilliant. And then also, what on earth is that like? any artwork, um, you know, for me, it's important to make something that's not just beige. Right. Um, I feel like there's more than enough watches uh, in the world at the moment. So if I'm gonna put something else out there, I would like it to be something that adds, um, you know, to the palette of culture. And uh, so being really, really creative for me is important in that respect. And also just personally, I learn a lot doing that. Um, so yeah, and I remember when I launched the very first Skull Watch, I mean, some of the reaction I got to that online was hilarious. Can you give, um, us, you give us an example? Well, I'll give you an example for the most recent one. <laughs> uh, what was the comment I got? Somebody take her computer away. <laughs> uh, to which my reaction was, I'm sorry, mate, but I draw everything by hand in a sketchbook, so unlucky for you. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you do, you literally get everything from, you know, something like that is something that's a little bit more harsh. Um, and I think what's important for, for me is that it's, I've got certain personal criteria um, which are important to me if I'm gonna, as I say, put something out into the world. And if it matches those, um, then the rest of it is sort of okay. Because I think if you do something to please somebody else, um, I mean, I don't even know how you would do that. You've got no control over what the entire world thinks of what you make okay. before it exists. So on that, that actual sentence, being a, a watch journalist, a freelance journalist, but um, being very much in the watch journalism community, there are very few in our community who will write negative reviews. Mm. Um, usually for me, if it's I, I don't like a watch, I, I won't write about it. Yeah. But I think that also sometimes does a disservice to a buyer, you know, an eye buyer, an internet buyer, a collector, do you do you think, you know, for us it's sort of like if we butcher a watch, we potentially, you know, we lose our nice press trips, we're shunned by the brands, we're not invited to things, we don't get the press releases when everybody else does. So there's a bit of a fear, but then there's also this, you're not really getting almost always a real reaction. It's, oh my God, that was the best thing I've ever seen on just about every watch anymore, and I'm being hyperbolic, clearly. So do you find that when you see those comments, you know, even if they can be harsh, do, 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 you, you know, do you value the fact that they were honest as opposed to when you do read mm. the watch reviews at, on, the, on the Ralphs, on the reputable online watch publications that over and over are just glowing or nice or, or, you know, or really regurgitated press releases in some cases? Um, I mean, do, do you at least appreciate, I think, when you see the online community give you their opinion, their honest opinion, even if it's, you know, even if it can hinder the design process for you or, or mess with your head a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, um, it doesn't impact my design process at Good. all, if I'm I, honest. I'm glad you said that. Um, not at all. Um, and I, I, um, I've had reviews that are also, they're not like a, well, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, you know, I think if it's very, um, if somebody's got something constructive to say, even if even if it's like I, I don't get it, and I, but I don't get it because X, Y, and Z, um, for me that's just as valuable as somebody going this is brilliant because I right. hope that if they say this is brilliant they'll go because X, Y, and Z, right? You know, um, and to be honest, I think it's one of these things that people in the industry talk about a lot, but 
people reading, and it's funny because you talk about it like it's, oh, the client and then us, but we're exactly the same. You know, if you're online and you're reading about, I don't know, watches or shoes or a hotel, I think it's pretty clear what stuff is, I would say, like an extension of advertising and that it's a very positive review in that sense. And, and what is somebody with a very objective point of view, I think most people can see right through that. So I think it's a non-issue, actually. Okay. And do you ever find, uh, and then I'm going to move on to you, Peter, with some similar questions, but do you ever find that because you're, you're not a watchmaker and you are a designer, mm. and this kind of, I think, goes even with all this is, you know, we were talking about that earlier, if you are just a designer, that the online watch community doesn't give you as much respect, or, or have they, you know, made comments that were maybe less than kind about the fact, because you weren't, you weren't an actual technical watchmaker? Um. Not really. Um, no, I've not, I'd, or not that I've read. Maybe they're out there and I just haven't read them. Um, no, not, not really. And I think that's because I've been completely transparent from the beginning, but not just transparent. It's, you know, a big part of my working practice is collaborative. So I love working with the people who help me to make the watches that I dream up in my head. Okay. And everybody knows who I work with. They're all over the website. I post about them because I'm proud of what they do. Um, and it's that process which I think is part of why the watches look the way that they do. It's a huge part of how we work. So I think because of that transparency, I've never had anybody sort of have a go and say, oh, well, you know, you don't, you're not a watchmaker, how dare you? Um, and I think even within the industry, people realise that it's an ecosystem. Everybody brings their little piece and it adds up. And what I thought was a big hindrance at the beginning, because I'm not from a watchmaking background, has actually been, I think, my biggest strength. Because I don't sit there and go, oh, it should look like this and it should tick these boxes. I just look right. at it and go, you know, even the most simple mechanism, when you wind it up and it starts going, I think, God, that looks brilliant. And right. then how can you, you know, and it looks like something else to me. And because I don't have that weight of all the, all the history and all the heritage and the very professional training. You know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I think if I'd had that training, excuse me, um, I probably would have closed myself off That's more. That's a valid point. Yeah. That's valid. So, Peter, I'm going to kick it over to you. Um, you, you founded your, your, uh, your first brand in 2002. Am I, do I have my stats correct on that? Uh, if I don't lie to me, Peter, lie to me. No, 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 2002 was okay, definitely 2002. the year. Okay, 2002, all right. Yeah. Um, the web is already ripe at that point with watch forms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with Time Zone and, and Purist Pro. It's 16 late years later now. It's a new watch brand later mm -hmm. for you. Um, how much did you pay attention to that web-based watch community then, if you did, and do you pay attention to it now, and, and, and how much? You know, the forums, the guys who are posting about those watches and, and uh, actually where a lot of today's most successful blogs largely stem from. I mean, mm -hmm. we have writers in this room who became, or actually came from, from some of those forums. Some, some were moderators on those forums. So do you, were you paying attention then? Uh, you know, the internet existed, it was out, it was, it was, we were all using it. Those forums existed. Did you find yourself going like, oh, did, I just put this out, like, what are people saying about it? When, when we began, it was just myself and my wife. And we had no real clear view of what to do. Uh, we kind of made it up as we went along. And <clears throat> we did everything that we could possibly do to make people aware that we actually existed. So we, were, we became a member of, I became a member of the AHCIA, which was a platform to be able to show people what it was that we did. And, and that was huge. At that period in time, there was a lot more people involved in, the, in, in paper, print, print and press. Um, and that was probably about 30 to 50% of the way we actually gained visibility and how people began to learn about what it was that I did. Running parallel to that was, as you mentioned, the purists of time zone. Right. And these were probably the most important elements. Without those forums, we would never have been able to touch the number of people that we did. Um, I would write, I'm not a writer, I'm not you, okay? 
but I would write whatever I could. That's to good because be... I'm not a watchmaker. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We it's, it's beautiful. Thank it's beautiful. Much. Okay. This is beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so everything that I could do to transmit what made me different, made my work different, I would write down, I would photograph, and I would share with these forums. Forums. Uh, and without the forums, as well as digital photography, because the two went hand in hand, I would never have been able to establish the business that I then went on to. Uh, I had probably a fairly substantial advantage compared to other people who came basically from nothing, as, as I did, which was that I'm English spoken, speaking. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Not today. Um, no, not, not, not today. Again, not today. Not today. Badly today. <laughs> um, so being able to speak in English to the Singaporeans, to the Americans, um, where the biggest markets were, mostly it was in California, New York, and, and Singapore at the time, that <clears throat> I was able to, to explain what it was, right. why we were different, uh, how mechanically it was different, how stylistically it was different, why the watches looked different, why they were, way, why, where the motivation came. So without the internet, without the technology, without digital photography, it would never have happened at all. Right. Jumping forward to, now, to today. To today. Well, back at that time, in the beginning, we had no idea what we were doing and we were stumbling along, but it was the beginning. Um, and there weren't that many people and there weren't that many forums and there weren't that many independents. Jump forward to 2018, and <clears throat> anybody can create an internet site. I mean, literally in a day, you can design a website. Right. Whether it's with uh, Shopify, or WordPress, or Squarespace, or 10 others, Wix. Uh, Wix. Um, all of these means of creating a shop front exist easily and virtually for free. Right. Um, to be able to produce watches, whether it's low level or high level. Uh, white, lab, white label, black label, private label, <clears throat> to a degree anybody can do it. So it's easier to do in the sense of manufacturing, and it's easier to be able to develop uh, a platform upon which you can actually sell your product, but the flip side is everybody's doing it. Right. So it's changed, but it's still hard to, yeah. be, able to, to be able to actually be heard. Um, it isn't... <clears throat> I think what it does do is that the, the stories, the storytelling that accompanies the brand has to be real, it has to be authentic, it has to come from somewhere which is real, genuine, I sure. would say. Otherwise, because of the weekly um, new brands which are actually appearing, um, it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to take it back to uh, the beginning. When, when it did make sense, when you would post on the forums and you would use those pictures. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a point as you were thinking forward to new collections where you were, those collections potentially in either their design or their mechanics were influenced by what was being said on the forums? Do, did you listen to the people who were talking about your watches and did you go, you know what, as I go to design this next piece, I, that's actually a valid point, I'm gonna keep that in no, mind. It's, it's impossible. Because you have, um, I don't know how many people there are, 100 people here. Everybody right. has got a different opinion. <clears throat> Everybody will say, will give a different uh, input. Uh, you have to be honest to who you are and what it is that you actually want to actually create to, to generate. Sure. Um, so, and on top of that, in relation to what people say, uh, everybody has an opinion. It doesn't mean it's the right opinion. Of course. And it, in relation to the people who criticize, when you actually confront the people that actually criticize, they quite often will actually change what they say. Because what people are prepared to say behind that keyboard and what they're gonna say in front of you are rarely the same thing. Okay, on that, and actually I wanted to ask you that too, Fiona. Had you ever had a time where you read a comment, you saw a poster, and it was just, you know, I, I, know, I know that when I write, a piece, you know, I, I heart and soul into that piece, and it's, it's my work in a mm -hmm. sense. And when somebody comes in and comments, and it's just off color or just blatantly mean, I want to jump through the screen and, and you know, take them by the neck, 
So, so, oh, that's on video. That's not good. Okay, but I mean, like, I, I get so angry. How do you separate emotion? Like, how did you separate then? I know you said it's slightly different now, but how did you separate those emotions when you knew that you had worked so hard to do something, and these these guys who I've never even seen your work likely in person would say something that would, you know, did you ever make a comment and get angry or, or, or have some, you know, get into it with somebody? I mean, any examples? I, yeah. Either one of you, actually, because we, we've kind of both, we've covered similar for, things for both of you. Um, like, tell me something juicy, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that if you're afraid of what anybody is going to say about you yeah. in our world, in this business, don't even begin. Don't do it. And from the first place, because the moment that you do something different in any form whatsoever, design, technologically, philosophy, it doesn't matter what it is, there are always people who will not understand it, and there will always be people who are critical of it, or there are people who think that they can do it better than you in one way or another. Right. So you just have to follow in the same way as as we have um, an example of the most unorthodox watches here, that is never going to be understood by everybody. Right. And it's going to be totally criticized by some and loved by others. That's the nature of, of what we do. That's the nature of this industry. Right. That's what actually makes it fantastic. That's what's the wonderful thing about it. Right, right. And if you had a product and somebody uh, said, it's nice, uh, I don't think there's probably much of that. There's, that's like the worst insult in the world. <laughs> there's no for, for, thought into yeah, it the, 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 If it's just like, that's nice, I mean, that, that doesn't stir any emotion. If somebody's actually aggressive about uh, a product, then that's created an emotion. So right. that's actually a good thing. Um, but you can't necessarily, you can do product research, market research, uh, when you get onto a different level. But when you're making small numbers of pieces, you have to follow what is true to you, so to speak. Okay. Dario. Ciao. 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 <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, from what I understand, you were born in 1992. Oh, yeah. You may said 1994. Now. There's a box of tissues that's going to go around the room. <laughs> um, so you, you were actually born sort of at the very end of the millennial generation. We talked about this yesterday. And you're very close to being uh, like, almost on the cusp of Gen Z. So you grew up in the age of the internet. Um, I'm sure you likely don't remember a world without the internet and, and without social media, so to speak. Um, you did an interview with AskMen.com where you were asked about what important lessons you learned since launching your brand in 2013? 2013, okay. yeah. Um, your reply was that it was not about academic experience or even professional experience. That can be self-taught. Uh, what is more important are the intangible assets, the ones that are intrinsic in a person's culture and the reason for doing things. Do you think growing up in the age of the internet buyer uh, made it easier for you to launch your brand successfully because you had more information available to you? Of course, it's not about information. I think it's, I am a millennial, so I understand kind of what we're looking at at the brand. Uh, we're looking at a brand that represents us, you know? Until six years ago, it was more of a product-centric approach. It was only about the product. Nowadays, you're looking at the activities that a brand do, how they communicate, how they talk. And uh, I'm also an outsider in, in the watchmaking, which was, until recently, a very closed industry, I think. Mm. So I could have looked at it from a more like uh, bird's eye view. And this was interesting because uh, brands like, for example, yesterday came and I saw a lot of Daniel Wellingtons around. <coughs> and Daniel Wellingtons are at the other side of what we're talking about, which is luxury watchmaking. And how come uh, we have like different kind of products, completely different kind of uh, business value models, but at the end, the consumers sometimes are the same. And we shouldn't only criticize, I think we should understand what is making them related. And I think it's about the approach. The approach is that until recently, luxury watchmaking was about product. Product was at the core of everything. Everything, how you communicate, what you say about the product, how you market it, where you position it, it's only product focused. Nowadays, I think, starting with my generation, it's not only about the product, it's about the experience, the lifestyle that it represents. So what is it about Daniel Wellington that's so iconic or revolutionary? It's not like the IWC-inspired look, or even Ice Watch when they did like, you know, Rolex and plastics. 
It's about the coherence in the brand, I think. It's uh, how they communicate what they represent. Like for Daniel Wellington, it's traveling. It's like a sort of like a cool Pantone colored uh, uh, brand in the positioning. They always have the same color. It's coherence that makes it uh, successful for me. Because at the end of the day, there's 50,000 other brands like Daniel Wellington. You could see around, you have not only successful one like Clues or Paul Hewitt uh, that, that show the same look, but you have even brands that are not so successful. And I think uh, luxury watchmaking, but all like even though these industries are completely different because they're competing at different price levels, I think it's important for like all watch brands to understand how coherence now is more important than only the product, and I think that was important for me. Okay, so um, I, as you uh, clearly you did your research before you launched at twenty, you were twenty two, when you 20, when, you, when I launched it, it was eighteen. Oh, you were eighteen. I'm sorry, you were yeah. eighteen when you launched the brand. You were eighteen. Yeah, two thousand thirteen. 19, yeah. Oh my god. Can I leave? Silver, yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> just go. oh my god. I have shoes older than you. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> what was something that you learned about selling to the internet buyers? Because again, you grew up in the internet. You know, prior to ever launching your product, what was something you thought, I know I absolutely don't want to do it this way or I do want to do it this way because I've watched how things are sold on the internet? So we didn't have an online website until like uh, 2016. Okay. So after three years, we started launching it. So I'm kind of an old soul. I looked at it from the other side. I wanted to like, understand more of how it was done uh, like, originally. So we started more in a, like, a traditional kind of approach for distribution, which was in uh, offline more than online. I don't think we should like, dissect and say, OK, this is online, this is offline. Nowadays, the world is intertwined. And this is very important. It's not that the consumer is different. Like, what is it an eye buyer? They're not like different kind of people. They're exactly the same. What they're looking at is that they're looking at, I think, uh, activations that when you go to Basel World, you make networking. Okay, you have Instagram stories showing it. People want to see more. They want to be more part of a brand. It's not only about okay having a cool product. It's about showing that the product represents you as a person. Okay. Okay. You cannot like represent all of the people because that would have been possible. Everybody is, as Peter said, it's subjective, everybody's different. But showing yourself is more authentic. So the authenticity is not anymore only in the product. The authenticity comes in the way you communicate, in the way you are as a team. That's why I said it in AskMen, as, uh, as a positioning, who are your distributors, who are your marketing agencies, just everything. The, the consumer now is very intelligent in understanding if it's real or not. Okay. Christoph, I'm going to ask you, because I think what he said something that even in the last panel, we talked about you know, whether or not the internet buyer and just the standard walking into your regular retail buyer is the same. Do you think that they're the same consumer? <clears throat> I would believe yes. Okay. <clears throat> I think I look at the eye buyer, someone that is actually doing his research, uh, getting information, trying to elevate his knowledge about a particular brand or particular product and would eventually still go to the store and the previous panel to talk about it. Uh, there is, I mean, like the panel said, we are no longer selling time because we all have mobiles that gives you time that set to a new time zone automatically without you doing anything. We're selling emotions. And, and I think that when you're selling emotions, you still need that personal connection, a one-to-one, sure. -one, face to face interaction uh, where you're going to make your final decision whether that product reflects your personality or reflects who you are. And that cannot happen just online. Online might help you build that perception and, and get the information you need to decide whether this brand or this brand talks to you more. But at the end, you will still probably end up into a store to get this personal interaction with a, a well-knowledgeable salesperson uh, to make that final decision. So you're, and I just want to make sure that I have your, your title correct. You're tre uh, Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer for Sadiq Holding. Um, how do, you, how do you and your marketing team, let's say, speak to the internet consumer in a way that, 
validates their thoughts and opinions about watches and yet still gets them walking through the doors of your boutique because, you know, I think, if I'm correct, Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons, they, they do not sell over the internet. No. Oh. Right? Right. So how do you, but you can't also dismiss that there is an internet community that is doing that research. So how mm -hmm. do you, how do you market to the iBuyer, but then also still get them walking through your doors? I think Dario just touched uh, upon it a little bit. It's all about experience. Okay. Uh, and I think that what people are more and more looking at is how can I get a unique experience? Uh, and I think that unique experience, the true fact that we're all sitting here today and that the Dubai Watch Week exists, is the answer right. to your question, is help people get their knowledge uh, up to date, uh, get people a platform where they can express themselves, share ideas, look at how the industry is evolving, uh, give them a place where they can get all the information that they want to complement maybe the personal research they did in the first place on, on the internet. And I think giving that platform for watchmakers, media, collectors, consumers to mingle together and, and create that knowledge sharing atmosphere has been a great answer uh, to uh, how you keep on attracting what you can consider an eye buyer right. into a walking customer into a brick and mortar stores. And I think if you look at how the market is evolving today, you have pure online players who probably five years ago would have said we will never do brick and mortar that are actually suddenly, you know, bringing brick and mortar experience sure. to what has been created in the first place as a pure online player. Uh, I think today it's, it's only one market. I agree with what Dario said. You, you cannot really say on one side you have the online and on the other side you have the, the brick and mortar. But uh, on that, um, and I'm going to throw out a, just a couple of stats, Bain & Company's Fall Winter Luxury Goods Worldwide Market Study for 2017, so just last year, retail luxury purchases grew 8% by the end of 2017. Clearly e-commerce is continuing on an upward path. Um, because online luxury goods sales jumped by 24% mm -hmm. by 2017. So luxury goods are Getting selling more traction online at more. an incredible mm -hmm. rate. I mean, and this may be putting you on the hot seat, but are there any plans for Amit Siddiqui and Son to add an e-commerce platform um, to their website, considering those actually are pretty substantial numbers? Yeah. But it's always easier to grow double digit when you're starting from low. True. So there is a perspective to be looked at in terms of numbers. Sure. Uh, as a modern retailer, as curator of times, it's obvious that a company like Sediki we will not disregard the, the online, definitely not. So there will be a time where I could see us actually uh, moving into that, uh, that segment. Okay. Uh, but, 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 no, again, but no plans on the horizon? No plan in the near future, in the near I mean future. In, the, in the next few weeks or months, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it could be earlier than that, it could be later, but it's definitely something as a strategy officer okay. that you have to keep in mind. All right. Uh, but again, I, I think it, it, it shouldn't be one against the other. Sure. Uh, it's just the way you... They can coexist. Yeah, and it's just the way you, you, you look at your business. Uh, I think for a long time or at the beginning of the internet and e-commerce, e uh, the e-commerce uh, was an extension of your store. Right. Okay? Uh, today we should look at it in a totally upside down way, which is e-commerce or online is the core of who you are and your store is becoming an extension right. of your online presence. So that's how I see and the evolution of luxury retailer uh, globally, might it be in the watch industry or any kind of luxury industry, is that you have to rethink the whole process. Uh, your store is your, an extension of your online and not the other way around. Yeah, and, well, I, and I think that's why you do see so many, uh, at least in the States where I live, um, you know, we had 
reputable online brands, jewelry brands, mainly who went to pop-up shops, and you know, it was really reversed, and it was amazing. We were going, this is. But again, going back to Dario's comment, it's all about the coherence because then everything has to be extremely coherent. Uh, your experience online or your experience in the store should be the same. Right. And you should fulfill that new customer or consumer uh, hungriness for education, for information. I mean, we have all experienced it. I mean, people enter a store today, the first thing they have is their mobile open, checking the price, checking the, the product, and, and saying, okay, this is what I want, do you have it here? And not only they're asking if the product is available, but they know exactly the price it should be. Right. Then they're taking and a picture of it. And you cannot take them on, on the right by being 20% or 10% more right. expensive. You, you have to be. So coherence is, is a key element of uh, maintaining uh, a good communication with your uh, end consumer, whether he's behind the screen or walking into a store. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a person who writes about watches, I sometimes forget that those who founded many of the major online watch publications um, start out really as members of this internet-based internet watch community. Or at least even if they weren't members, if they weren't on the forums, you know, these were guys who were researching online and Googling pictures of Paul Newman's watches and, and other famous people and then posting to the forums about uh, the research. So it's clear the internet-based watch community has resulted largely in positivity for brands, as you mentioned, Peter, earlier, by birthing, so to speak, what we now know as the reputable online watch publications, many, many of whom are, you, uh, are here today. Um, my next question has, it, it's funny, it's, I, I, I have an opinion about this. Uh, it's not really my place as the moderator to state it, but, and I remember getting in a car last year with Max Booser. We were in Florida for an event, and I had like a solid hour and a half drive with just Max and me. Max was driving, and that's like gold to get an hour. And you can't get him a show, and and you know again, he's a wealth of information, and to pick his brain for an hour and a half was astonishing. And we talked about this very topic, and. I think we felt kind of differently about it. So I want to ask uh, this specifically to you, Peter, and you, Fiona, as well. What are your thoughts on the reputable online watch publications that have added e-commerce to their business model, making them now retailers, in a sense? And then what are your thoughts on the existing e-commerce watch sites, whether they're, I won't say gray market, but like resale sites that have now added editorial teams who are actually showing up to shows like Basel World and SIHH as members of the press. We're, we're literally seeing now this, you know, it's, oh, I was a journalistic website, but now I sell watches to the public. And I don't mean watch straps. I think a lot of sites did the accessories and cases and rolls and, and watch straps. I mean watches, brands, and it's, and it's, you know, cool. And then you have maybe resale sites that now are, are they're full they're fully staffed with editorial writers and so now they're retailers but they're getting press passes so what are you know, and I'm going to ask you about that what do you what do you feel about that i mean as a as a brand so to speak i mean do you <clears throat> think that there can be sort of unbiased editorial if you're selling the brands directly to the public the two the two entities are becoming the same thing and it's an inevitability at the end of the day. If you have um, a company because of the content producing a following of a million people, the company sort of intelligently uh, and also for, for practical reasons wants to commercialize on what their assets are so they end up actually selling watches. The companies who are selling watches who have done that habitually and started that point need to be able to maintain their place so they need to develop the content to attract people to them so it's kind of a, a circle um, the whole I guess ultimately they'll, they're going to become the same creature I mean I, I would assume um, when it comes to their points of view it will be 
are they going to be telling the truth? Are they going to be selling the product? Are they going to be marketing the product? Are they going to be educating the end consumer? Um, that's impossible to really say. Um, that is why, in a sense, like my primary occupation today is uh, an educational site. Sure, which and, is phenomenal, by the way. And it is. And uh, thank you. Uh, and the the object of that site is actually to be completely objective. It doesn't talk about prices because pricing is ultimately subjective. Right. It doesn't even talk about quality for the most part because quality is also a subjective issue. So the only thing that I think can happen in the future is that this, the growing number of people who are becoming more and more informed will become better educated, they'll become more discerning, and as they become increasingly discerning, the level of the publications within these different platforms that are selling watches will have to remain uh, true. They have to remain authentic and honest. Authentic is not the right word, but honest. Because if they're not, they will be blown out of the, out of the water. Do you think that they will, though? Because I, I mean, I, I see it happening now where, you know, it, it's always been like, oh, these people advertise on our site, we should write about I mean, that's not, that goes yeah. back to there's, print. There, there's, it depends what you define as being marketing uh, at the end of the day. Right. Um, ultimately, nobody can lie uh, convincingly or for any period of time on the internet. Uh, because if you are not truthful about where your movement comes from, your components come from, or your case is made, ultimately the likelihood is that they're going to get you. People are going to find out. Yeah. And it is, I think it is an essential, which is a good thing, that people have to be transparent about it as well. Yeah. So the more people who become informed, the more of these sites, the more prestigious these sites become, perhaps, I'm not saying it's the case, but perhaps they will actually have to maintain a, a level of, authentic, not authenticity again, but truth behind the story to maintain their, their image, to, remain, to maintain their, their reputation. Um, because there's, there's just too many people and there's too many supposed specialists in the business that you have to, you have to maintain um, the, the truth of each product. Sorry, I'm not eloquently expressing myself. Um, but I think probably those, those sites which are becoming bigger, maybe that's a good thing. Okay, because you've got a thousand smaller companies, some who are incredibly pertinent and credible, and then you've got others which are less so, shall we say. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there are a, a handful of the smaller companies. You know, my blog is a one-woman mm -hmm. show. I don't have a single advertisement on my blog, and I write it just kind of a, as a yeah. hobby. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's completely unbiased. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably only biased in the sense that sometimes I'll write about just people I like. Yeah. But it's, but it's unbiased by the almighty dollar, in other mm -hmm. words. And so, Fiona, I, I wanted to ask you the same thing. So do, do you feel that there are publications, you know, reputable publications that, that have been around, that are online, who are now selling direct to public, do you think that they're truly editorial in your eyes, that they can, that they can write about products completely unbiased? Um. Yeah, I do actually. I mean, I, to be honest, I don't really have a problem with that because for me, it's all about the consumer. So the guy or the woman who's going to spend the money to buy the watch, we all hope, since we're all in an industry where we're making stuff and you hope people like it and they'll buy it. So if, and I, as well as that, people aren't daft. You know, if you go on a website, that's a journalistic website, and you see that they sell a certain brand and they also write, write about it, that partnership I think is quite obvious and I don't really have a problem with that. I think if you're writing an article it might be um, polite or considerate to put you know I don't know like partner brand and I as a reader wouldn't assume that that means oh it's only going to be positive stuff it's just FYI sure. we also sell this brand. And, um, and in, in some places of the world including the United States Federal Trade Commission guidelines tell us yeah. You have to legally disclose if they're a partner brand, yeah. if you've been paid, because if not, it breaks federal law. Yeah. And they are mm -hmm. cracking down on influencers <coughs> and bloggers who are getting paid and posting about it and not disclosing it. But I, I like the idea of a partner brand. I think that's I Yeah, I mean, and, and for me, I feel like the more um, 
it's about making it as easy as possible for somebody who loves watches and would like to buy one to be able to buy one. You know, all, all of the other sort of more political stuff, I think, is like within the industry, we all care about it. But what does the actual consumer who's buying the product think? Right. If it's easy for them, it gives them the information they need. Um, they'll go on the website and see what's what and they'll make a call anyway. So for, for me, it's kind of a, a non-issue really. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Christoph, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to you really quickly. How do you see the brands, and, and again, this was somewhat touched on a little bit earlier, um, in, a, in a slightly different way. How do you see the brands carried by uh, Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons, of which, according to your website, look like 62 brands, watch brands, major watch brands. Um, speaking directly to the internet buyer, and, and I'm going to go back to this because that is what this is about. I mean, this is we are going to go after that internet culture. Um, w with all of the information that's available on the web, which brands do you think connect best mm -hmm. with the internet buyer? Uh, it's probably a better question for you. You know, if you could give us a, a couple of examples with. We talked about earlier, Richard Mill connects with, but with an actual internet customer where you see, if you go to the watch forums and you uh, read comments or you look on Instagram, which of these brands are really, really, they're, they're in there with, with the, that community of uh, internet-based watch lovers? I think we're yet to see a brand being innovative in the way they communicate with the uh, iBuyer. It's pretty much a little bit of a copy and paste kind of a strategy. Uh, everyone is more or less doing the same. Uh, I mean, it's all about, you know, uh, lifestyle, uh, product shot, ambassadors, uh, friends of the brands, uh, name it uh, the way you want, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's endorsement. Uh, and uh, to, to a certain extent, it, it probably works well. Uh, but I'm yet to see a brand that is really, you know, using this, you know, digital world in, a, in an innovative uh, way that really engage with the customer. Uh, yeah, you can collect thousands of likes because such ambassador has been uh, sure. visiting your factory and it's nice. But is it really engaging the customer? Maybe you should invite a customer to the uh, factory rather than the right. brand ambassador. So yeah, I, my vision is that yeah, there's a lot of happening. Uh, at the end, it contributes to elevate and communicate about the industry. So it helps cons consumer uh, get more knowledge about the industry. But again, and I repeat myself, I I'm yet to see a brand that really engage, using really the tools that are at their disposition to, to really engage. Okay. All right. This is going to actually go out to the, to the four of you guys. Don't kill me on it. Um, is influencer a dirty word? Uh, first, I want you to give us what your definition, what it means to you. When you hear influencer, what, what, how do you define that personally? Um, and then talk to us about whether or not you feel their presence in the industry um, and at, at watch fairs like SIJH or, or Basel World adds value to the industry through their coverage of the brands. So, if, and carte blanche, feel free, whoever wants to go first with this one. You're the youngest. The youngest. <laughs> okay. And you, and do, correct me if I'm wrong, you do use influencers on your Instagram page, correct? I think any brand should. But the thing is, now influencers have a negative connotation. You know, they're only Instagram influencers. And I think it's, it's wrong. For me, an influencer is somebody who influences the purchasing habit of the, the consumer. So. If somebody is into like sport, an NBA player, for example, is an influencer. It's not only about Instagram influencers, it's also about in, in real life if they do something that actually like intertwine with the brand's values. And you need it because if your purpose is to represent a certain lifestyle, uh, for example, your lifestyle is uh, uh, to cater to NBA players, then an NBA player is the kind of influencer that you need. Richard Mille, for me, is like a brand that has, on the luxury watchmaking, is one of the few brands that actually got it. In the end, like it, it's 100K, it's known worldwide. It was not there 
a long time ago, like not like Patek Philippe, Rolex, and Audemars Piguet. So how did they did it? You have the best tennis players in the world, the best sports players in the world, rich people, Instagram influencers like Wachan is putting them. So obviously, like this influences the perception of that brand and the influence in a way that now Richard Mille is uh, uh, renowned worldwide. And I think it's not only about doing something, yes, maybe there's no brand that's doing something completely different, but the details make the difference in this world and Richard Mille is doing something different with respect to other brands. Some brands, for example, uh, try to copy and paste what is, do, what is like brands like Richard Mille are doing and uh, I think the consumer kind of recognizes it. Because like details again, like even in a product, the details make the difference. Even in this new like fashion of influencers, the detail of the influencers you choose, what they represent, how they uh, communicate, what type of picture they take, what type of colors they use, even what type of like messages they they cater to, then I think it, that makes a difference as well. Okay, who's next? Anybody else? I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> no, Fiona. Have you had influencers approach you and say like, oh, we, you know, pay us X amount, we want to wear your watch, like how, what are your vibes? What, what, um, do you, what vibe do you get when, they, when that happens? Well, I think I have a completely different definition of what an influencer is yeah. because I wouldn't consider that an influencer. For me, it's like a new way of advertising or marketing. Right. For me, an influencer is somebody that um, actually impacts my... Uh, way of thinking or my 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 buying choice because um, their opinion has some weight to it, right? So, uh, for example, in Japan they have this um, way of working with the uh, big department stores where you have a, a gay show, which mm -hmm. goes back to you know at the time when um, you know they would select or show their clients the fabrics um, to have your kimono made. Now. That guy may have like, I don't know, five people that follow him on Instagram, but he's my influencer because sure. he knows his client. I trust his taste. He says something about culture. So for me, influencers got nothing to do with the number of followers, the likes or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That's why what you were saying about, for example, the sports star, it's not even about how well known they are. It's more like when I look at them and when they speak or the way that they play or how good they are, that for me has an influence. Okay. The rest for me is just advertising. So have you not had, and I'm gonna go influencer in the traditional sense of, I'll use like Darius said, in Instagram influencers. Um, you know, hey, I approached you, I have 250,000 followers, I'd like to wear your watch, I think it's fantastic, will you pay me a bunch of money? I mean, have you had anybody approach yeah, you yeah. like that? Yeah. yeah. And what's your response? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you know that we exist and I'm flattered that uh, you like what we do to the point that you would put it on, but um, no thanks. Purely because for me they, they don't influence. Right. You don't feel it's going to boost your brand? No, I think it, it, for me it, it is like another way of having like a big sandwich board with your brand on it that says we exist. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so, I don't know, I think there's other ways, and it, it might just be very specific because of the sort of product that we make and, and that kind of thing, that there's a different sure. approach. Do you, uh, Christoph, I mean, you're in Dubai. There are a lot of influencers in Dubai. Do you, do you, do you guys work with any <clears throat> that you feel are... Maybe not in the way you may think about, but okay. more like, I mean, at the end of the day, I put, and we, uh, put our trust and faith in the, in the consumer uh, to be smart enough to recognize yeah, an influencer who's basically a paid promoter or an influencer right. that shares the value, the same value that you have, that actually loves the product that he is going to endorse and talk about it with passion and, and, and true values. Uh, so that, that will be our approach to the world of influencer is working with people that actually first and foremost uh, do share the same value we have as a company and would appreciate uh, the product and most of the time, if not 100% of the time, uh, they won't be paid for it because okay. it's a shared passion. Do, do you, so in other words, do you use people then who are, are like, they understand watches? Because that's the other thing too is I think some of the journalists in the room are nodding their head when I when I mentioned this earlier, 
you know, you have the influencers who are showing up to the shows who do not know anything about watches. Uh, that, but, that will probably be people we won't work with, you know, at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, but you have prefer to, be to passionate. work with people who actually have some sort of base level education, yeah, whether who, it be on the brand. Who understand product. and appreciate, you know, the, this art of watchmaking. Okay. I'm talking about it as an art, and it was one of the discussion points in the previous panel, and that's why we're talking about emotion more than actually setting time, you know? Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I think, I don't think the influencers is a, is a newcomer. It's just a, a new name and much more visible today because of the uh, access to information and the digital world. But look at cinema critics who were writing on newspaper years ago. They are in, in some way influencers. They can make or destroy a movie. Right. You know? Okay. At the end of the day, the, the end choice is, and I, that's why I said I, I put my trust and faith in the, in the consumer to, to take the decision that he feels good with. You know? yeah. uh, I, I read an article recently that, that goes back maybe at your first question in, in the panel. Uh, one of the most hated brands on the digital space that drives a lot of negative comment from so-called watchmaking expert is Hublot. It's, of course. Yeah? Is, the, is this impacting their commercial success? No. Why? Because at the end, the consumer will make a choice right. that is not necessarily dictated by so-called expert or influencers, but he make a, a, a choice because that product talked to him, right. because that product represents him the best, and whatever people say about it is, is, gonna, is gonna go for it. So, well, I have one more question, and then I think we're, we are going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. And this is for the panel as well. And again, uh, we lightly touched on this earlier. Um, Gen Z, and I, I've really been doing, for the last couple of years, I've really been doing my research on this next generation. And I'm, I'm perplexed and ecstatic and blown away, and I'm raising two of them myself. So it's, I'm really, really focused on them. They are, they are, they are the new eye buyer because they are known as the influenced generation. And that does not, not mean the influencer generation, but they don't respond to brand ambassadors. They're not about it. They don't care about celebrities. They love YouTube. I mean, there could be a, a, somebody on YouTube who is an, an absolute nobody, but because they have you know, 84,000 subscribers, that's suddenly someone who influences the teenagers of today. How? Individually, doing what you do, you know, you, on the retail side, in a sense, doing what you do, you're really selling on your website direct to public. And being a watchmaker, being a designer, are you thinking about this generation? Are you thinking about the future, this next group of I internet buyers? And you know, what do you think? How do you, how do you say to yourself, I know you, you said, I have to do what I do. This is, you know, I'm into watchmaking. I'm not really worried about that. And not, it's not so much worried about it, but does it ever cross your mind? Will this watch be appealing to someone younger? Will it be appealing 20 years from now? You know, to, do you think about them? And, and how do you intend on, in a sense, reaching the next group, bypassing millennials, but, but now setting our sights on this next group of kids who are going to be the largest generation ever? Open question. It is an open, open question. question. Unless you want me to pick on you, Peter, no, you go no, first. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Um, well, how do you address that generation? Um, I think it's something which was mentioned on the previous panel mm. and it's something which will keep coming back again and again. Um, is that conventional marketing. marketing doesn't function in the way that it does. Um, the previous point about influences is justifiable because people like people and people need to listen and or be provoked. But fundamentally, it's about education. Right. That's why I developed, I started to develop a year ago the Naked Watchmaker because the new generation can see straight through and I mean our generation as well because we're born into it, but also a new generation because they're part of it. Uh, they are, the moment they have a Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, or whatever account, they are in a sense their own brand. And you can't sell to those people right. in a conventional way. 
But what you can do is you can share with them what is real. You can share with them the history of where watchmaking comes from. You can explain to them the points which differentiate one brand, one mechanism, um, one product from another, from another product. And that is what I love. That's why I do what I do. And I think that is kind of a key element to assuring the, the, the future of watchmaking. Um, the industry maybe as a whole, and it's not uniquely that, because all these other factors play parts in relation to conventional marketing. But people, this generation needs to understand why. Um, it's not necessarily about quality, it's not even about price. It's just about the why behind the products. Right. And I think the more people understand not what does brand X mean, what does it represent, but where does it come from? Some people won't care, a lot of people won't care, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the knowledge has to be passed on. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily associate to what is the latest innovation from whatever brand has just come out with something new, but it's the whole story. It's this whole history. Um, and that's why, for me, well, I, I, do, I come from the vintage world, and I like sharing about the vintage world. Um, I'm a, innately, I'm an independent watchmaker because of my character, but I have a pre appreciation for large brands. I cross over, it's all watchmaking, right. okay? I don't have time or I don't care about positioning. When it comes to status, positioning when it comes to what a product should cost in relation to what it is, that's something else altogether. That's just, that's like com common sense from, from my point of view. Um, but really, to be able to speak to Generation Z, um, it's education. And then the education in a particular fashion. Um, and in the future, it's inevitable, it's going to be more and more active. It's going to be videos. So I was going to say, well, again, multimedia yeah. is really yeah. the way, I think, Dara, you probably agree with me. I mean, multimedia is the way to speak to a YouTube generation. Uh, the Naked Watchmakers, I mean, that to me potentially seems like what you're doing in terms of education, but then to throw that into a YouTube channel would be almost an ideal way to, to by the way, you, you see, can- there's Marc-Andre Mar yes. over there, okay, yeah. all right. Oh, you got, oh, I, sh okay. so I, I shouldn't have told him about that. Is there like something that works? Okay. He's brilliant at what he does, Again, and he's been doing it for years. He's brilliant and so he, handsome yeah. all at the same time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. What more could you possibly want? <laughs> okay. Anyone else care, care, to, care to touch on this? <laughs> Dario, I, I mean, I'm feed me. Yeah. The next is the past generation. Uh, Gen Z, I mean, I, okay. you, I feel like you probably kind of have it down how to reach them. I think, like, when there's going to be Generation Z and then uh, the future generations after that, all brands will have to evolve. And this doesn't mean like changing their products. Maybe it's changing the way you communicate, like now it's changing the way you communicate. Right. Brands cannot stay like rigid and fixed. This is like in history, like all brands have to evolve, have to evolve to local tastes, so how generation change. What's important for me is keeping the core because the brands that do not succeed these transitions are not the brands that change the way to communicate, or maybe sometimes even their products, is the brands that lose the essence, the identity of their brands. For example, I'm not going to do names, but some brands, like some big brands, are doing digital watches because Apple did it. Okay, Apple is cool, but Apple is something on its own, and there's a reason why Apple is doing the Apple Watch and is selling millions and millions of pieces. Some brands can do digital watches, I'm not questioning that, but it has to be part of their identity. And all these fashions now, for example, customizations, uh, organic, which is sustainable, whatever you want, some brands can evolve and cater to the new generation of these kind of strategies, but I think now and in the future, brands will have to do this, keeping their core, their identity, like fixed. They cannot change that. Otherwise, they're going to die. So that's my okay. idea of it. Anybody else? If not, I think we're going to open up to I'm, questions. Yeah, oh, I would have yeah. maybe just said that from what I find interesting with the internet is I think people see it as like, oh, we used to sell this way. And now there's this new thing, so how do we manage it so we can like optimize what we sell, right? But the internet is, and just the whole technology around it with AI and all of that kind of thing, for me is absolutely fascinating because there's no limits, really. Which means that it's like this whole other world of potential that you have. So it's like an extension of your product. 
So the whole online offline thing for me, I think for, I mean, my generation and even the next one, I think if you can hit the sweet spot between the two, that's where it's really interesting. Right. Where it's not just a case about like, oh, we have a, a, an online platform and then you can go into the shop and we do an experience in the shop. You can do so much more than that, where you're, you're the extension of your product or the way you communicate or all of that stuff, you can be more interactive with online in a way that makes people want to come offline. I mean, if you think about it, why the hell is Amazon opening up a bricks and mortar right. shop? Well, that's why I said right? the, the US is infamous for that. Uh, if you look at, so you've got the rise of streaming. In parallel to that, you've got vinyl sales going through the roof. Yeah. And these are all examples of the more digital stuff there is, the more creative you are with that. People want like a cultural touchstone, you know, to relate to. And I think finding ways for them to ping pong off each other is really interesting. So it goes beyond marketing and communication to me that the, the internet and technology is this new tool that I think we should rather play with because you can have fun with it. And yeah. then you know, we're making watches, which should be fun and pleasurable. So maybe we could think in that way, you know, with the rest of it. Um, maybe it's just, I mean, I'm sure if I, you know, said to my dad about, oh yeah, the internet programming and it's fun, he'd be thinking, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's quite fun. It doesn't sort of intimidate me. And I think working with it in that way would be a way to, you know, for future generations, be a bit more playful, would be a way to go, I think. Okay. Well, thanks, you guys. <coughs> thanks so much. Uh, Maybe just, just to add, oh. I think... I keep cutting everybody <laughs> off. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> at the end, I think honesty will, will be the answer to all that amount of information that is available. Mm. And whoever stays and communicates with this Generation Z uh, consumer in a very honest way uh, will probably uh, be well perceived. Uh, I think the they are so well informed and that they will quickly understand uh, who has an honest, passionate, Absolutely. Uh, true message to someone who's been building up a story uh, and not being entirely honest. But very short attention spans. And I think, and it, I think it the is. They're, they're the swipe generation. Yeah, it, it's, if they're not, they're out. But You've got to catch them in, think, in that, that moment. I, if I'm not wrong, Generation Z is also extremely interested in personalization. Uh, millennials. Gen Z wants to be part of a group. That's, it's actually, they're the anti-millennial with that. Millennials want it to be unique, but, you know, personalized. But within that, that group, they want a message that is... Within the group, yeah. Within the group. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think the watch industry not being a mass produce industry is if, is if we look at the entry to luxury and, and luxury, I think there is a unique business opportunity uh, to be able to really uh, adapt to a, a new audience in probably an easier way than a, a mass produce uh, industry would, uh, would do. So I think there is opportunities and threat in every uh, new businesses, but the way the market is evolving and the expectation of the end consumer uh, is, I think the, the watch industry is well placed to be able to answer to that in a, in a successful way. Might it be online and or offline? And sure. as, we, as we said, I think there is no difference now anymore between, between the two. Okay. Did I get everybody? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have, yes, uh, gentleman, in the, uh, gentleman in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, reflecting on something that, that Christophe said about how film critics are really influencers. Um, in the 1950s, the film critics of the French magazine Cahiers du Cinéma went on in the 1960s to become the best directors of French cinema. Do you think any of the current generation of influencers will ever play a significant role in the industry? That's a, that's a magnificent question. What? Why not? You know? <laughs> okay, I mean, which oh, it, 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 well, can I oh, actually say we have uh, J Jack isn't here yet, is he? Yeah. Is Jack Forster in the room? He's one, one of the moderators tomorrow. Jack Forster is now the editor in, Ho uh, editor in chief of Hodinkee, but was, I believe, a moderator on Purist Pro uh, after just being sort of like toying with pocket watches as a hobby. So, in a sense, he was 
I guess, an influencer of his mm -hmm. generation because he was this moderator on a watch forum and now is editor in chief of an extraordinarily <laughs> popular, so much so people drop things, <laughs> uh, website. So I think that, I, I, I mean, I think that was a brilliant question. Anybody else want to pitch in? I guess that's no. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of a way that the internet is influencing uh, tastes, and I'm, I'm going to pick the example of Omega and Speedy Tuesday, because this has become phenomenally successful. It's, it's operating in the same way that certain brands like Suprema, where they do these drops, and there's this feeding frenzy across the internet. How far do you think that that is individuals influenced by the fact that this is suddenly a hot item, I'm just going to buy it anyway, even if it doesn't suit my preferences at all. Knowing that I can sell it on, probably for more money, they are capitalizing on something, a hashtag, Speedy Tuesday, that came across IG. So they are influencing individual preferences, whether or not the individuals want those preferences or not. <laughs> was that a statement or a yeah. question? <laughs> that, was, that was a question? Oh, so, so in other words, Chandler. will you discuss? Yeah, that's how, okay. We have Robert Chandler. Yeah, I was going to say, I know. I, I was shooting him a look. He didn't look up. Uh, any, anybody? Um, I feel like I've spoken too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Pressure's on you, Peter. No, it's... I don't know. There's, when you have those kind of um, phenomena, um, they're the kind of things that I, I assume they'll be, they can be successful on day one, and then it'll fail on day two. Um, I have no idea. I really don't. I, I, I wish I could. I think that's more sort of a, that's a sales question. Uh, it's an, okay, a marketing question. But when it comes to the, the long-term validity of such a thing, I have absolutely no idea. I, I, can't. I think, too, you're talking to an independent watchmaker, you know, an independent brand, um, a, a young man who, who launched his own brand to a very specific audience. Omega is Omega. You know, it's part of Squ Swatch Group. It's, I think it's slightly different. I think, yes, if... Um, you know, one of the Swatch Group brand, like a Longines, put out a watch and then suddenly the entire internet community started saying, my God, we'd really love to see this in rose gold. There is a good chance that they would make it in rose gold. But that's slightly different. I, I feel that that maybe is slightly different because it's just a bigger, you know. I was showing the Converse case, which is, in this instance, they flash on something that is not necessarily, they flash on something that is individual preferences, but it's sort of almost like a voting thing that they see on IG, the number of Sure. Or the number of times someone reposts Speedy Tuesday on a Tuesday, uh, or maybe any other day of the week, but let's go with um, And so in that instance, the internet is starting to influence individual preferences. So it seems to go against what the panel was concluding, that the influences were going to work, whereas in fact, this has worked very successfully both for Omega and for the instigators of Speedy Tuesday. But for me, that's, the, that's not necessarily influencers I don't think for me that's like um, the sort of community of people who are really into it is this underground thing and because of that it had a real authentic appeal and then the brand uh, were sort of awake and went oh that's quite interesting and then they sort of work together that for me is different than than I think what everybody assumes is the sort of yeah Instagram influencer. For me, they're two different things. I think it's like, for example, in fashion, you have uh, Vetmo, right, who sell T-shirts and sweatshirts that are you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But I mean, it's a very basic sort of item of clothing, and that the I mean those things sell out at the drop of a hat because they I think are tapped into the sort of zeitgeist of a generation or a group of people or whatever and it's it becomes part of culture and then as a brand and a company they see that and then they can do more with it so for me it's more that that's how I see it working rather than it being uh, an influencer sort of thing and I, th I think that's why it's popular because the the root of it was you know a kind of uh, yeah like a sort of underground that was the root of it right there I believe yeah 
That's literally underground. Cool. That's Robert Young. Yeah. yeah. So, he is the root of it. But, but he that's does what like I mean. He looks great in a dress. Yeah. <laughs> Standing on a street corner with a photographer. <laughs> Yellow heels, amazing. Yeah. So I think I think that's why because it came from some t from something sort of authentic and then grew from there. That's why I think. And then you know, obviously the internet. I mean, that's another part of the reality of today's as a brand. So you have your little world, your little idea. You do the best thing that you can do, be it with product or marketing or whatever. But then you don't actually have any control. You, it, I mean, it goes, and then it's this organic thing. And then you, you, I think, engage with how it develops. And that's obviously what they've done extremely well with what you started. Yes, uh, I would like to, to bring in uh, Robert Chen to the conversation, because the, the most recent uh, ingredients to, to this discussion is that I feel that Odinki the, the limited editions, uh, it, uh, there's a, a backlash. I'm sorry, who, a, a who did you just say? I never heard of them. The, ba the <laughs> backlash, uh, it's, it's ba what is the word, backlashing? Because mm. a lot of people are starting to, to be a little bit fed up. And the Robert Chen's uh, initiative, is, yeah, as Fiona ex explained, it's, it's, it's about the community. His venture is not even commercial because it's, he has his own website sure. and, and it, it's, it's Omega, it's an Omega thing. Uh, so I was... Uh, I would like to bring him to the to the conversation. He's a, he's, a, he's a bit shy, but I think he's the best the best person to, to talk about it right now. I'd like to ask Robert Chen if uh, if he feels what how does he feel that uh, his uh, initiative the the second one was really successful, and then right afterwards there was the Odinki uh, uh, Lim Om Omega limited edition, and there was a lot of a backlash. And as someone here Is said, that the one for their ten year anniversary. Yeah, the, the and as someone here said, people start to look at, for instance, Odinki uh, limited editions as, as an investment. So, Robert Chen? <laughs> <laughs> he is tall. I mean. Hello, I'm Robert I'm from uh, Fratello Watches, and uh, I'm the instigator of uh, Speedy Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and to be clear, it didn't start on, on Instagram. So. I don't want to call myself an, an influencer. Um, I'm an editor, journalist, uh, I'm not sure. I try to be one. Um, but first of all, I was a Speedmaster collector, and that's how it started. And the team of Fratello, they're all Speedmaster collectors. I, I think we have over 100 in total with a team of six. And the Speedy Tuesday was something that we started to just give the watch attention, the different versions, the history, the legacy, the, the Moonwatch story. Out of, out of hobby, out of passion for, for this specific model. And we did it on a Tuesday because uh, I took a picture of my watch on a Tuesday. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, <laughs> and I had a discussion with Omega and they said, um, um, what can we do together? And I said, well, that was in 2016. And I said, next year in 2017, it's five years that we do this Speedy Tuesday thing. We have written over 250 articles on one watch model. So I want to celebrate this. And um, not a button or a pen or a t-shirt, but a watch. And then the new, then new CEO of Omega, he said, why not? So we came up with a design. They had some feedback. We waved it. <laughs> and we, we went back and forth with the design. And we came up with Speedy Tuesday. And we thought, we, we want to sell this. And we said, well, let's do it through the internet. Because we are online. I'm, I, I'm very much online. I have an IT back, uh, background. And uh, it sold out in a few hours, and the last one was, was, was this year, the Ultraman, and it sold out uh, within two hours. And um, so it was a huge success. And the fact that there are over 10,000 people on the waiting list uh, wow. for one watch is the proof of the success. And I also believe that, there are, of course, there are uh, speculators in there. Uh, you have collectors and you have speculators. <coughs> I, like to, I like the first people. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the speculators, that's fine. Whether you speculate with, with houses or buildings or estate, whatever, or watches, that's, I don't mind that much, as long as there are enough watches to supply to the real collectors. Um, to answer your question, um, it, it seems like it backlashed a bit on Hodinki. And I had a small brief discussion with Ben about it. Um, we also got a bit of the backlash because they said, oh, there's a second Speedy Tuesday. and. It has become very commercial, blah, blah, blah. And of course, that's true. But you can't please everyone. Mm. And I think that's also the message that I heard on stage. 
you can't please everyone, and I think you have to keep that in mind. And um, that the fact that the Hodinki watch sold out in like 20 minutes, I think it's the proof that there is enough demand for such a watch. And if you don't like it, it's very simple. Don't, don't buy, buy it. it. Mm. Right. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One question, Robert Chen. Oh, sorry. So, have you discussed with uh, Omega the fact that people are saying we've been swamped with, 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 with Speedmaster editions, it's too much? Of course. So, uh, because between the Ultraman and the Hodinki special, there was the Japan Tokyo 2020 special. Oh. So I said, yeah, it's, it's a bit much. And they acknowledged, and let's see what will happen. But the fact that there is such a high demand for these things, I, if people keep buying them, the companies will keep producing them. It's, it's that simple, I guess. That's true. Yeah. Do we have any more questions for the panel, actually? Carlos, thank <laughs> yes. you. Hi. Maybe uh, a mm -hmm. different question for Christophe. Do you think in, the, in this age of the internet, the internet is empowering brands to skip the retailer? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> could be. Uh, could be. I mean, uh, you, you cannot offset uh, this and, and completely disregard it. Uh, but, I mean, this is why, and, and here I'm going to sound like I'm promoting ourselves, Sadiki, but uh, this is, and thanks to our marketing team, I mean, that's why we did this Dubai Watch Week. Uh, Dubai Watch Week has set us apart uh, in, the, in the world of watchmaking retailers because since day one, it was a strategic intent and a very, very strong strategic intent was all about education and being non-commercial. And I think that talks a lot to the watch community. Might it be the press, might it be the watchmakers, might it be the uh, collectors and, and consumers, is that and I go back to one of the last statements I made. It's being, just being honest, doing an event where we educate people and where we don't have a short-term commercial intent. And I think today's consumer is well aware of uh, what's happening around uh, them, the marketing messages from the brand, uh, finding XY brand uh, both on the brand website and then on Mr. Porter and then on this website. Uh, but what's the message at the end and how much you contribute to elevate the debate and help the, the, the promotion of the industry as a whole and, and educate the end consumer. Uh, I think I, I said it, I mean, I put my trust and faith in the, in the end consumer and, and, and an event such as Dubai Watch Week, which is non-commercial, uh, has had a great, great, great positive resonance uh, for the community, for uh, for Sediki ourselves as a retailer, but also for the brands, and uh, so I think, I mean, competition is everywhere, and uh, rather than swimming against it, uh, just uh, swim with it, and, and be innovative, and be a forward thinker, and look at uh, what you can do differently, so that you set your tone and you set yourself apart, mm -hmm. and you compete in that environment uh, with uh, different tools and ammunitions. Uh, so that's, that's my answer. But Can I um, maybe just respond to that? Because I think that's really interesting what you've said. Like for me, the, it's part of even the debate about um, you know, trade shows and how relevant or not they are, right? And if I was living on the other side of the planet and you come over for a trade show and your experience is not that different to what you would get in a retailer in your home country, it's, it, it's a missed opportunity. And so that's why I think, you know, what's been done with Dubai Watch Week, um, unfortunately, um, my husband and I didn't get to go the last few years, but I was watching everything online because the, the conversations, you know, like particularly the one this morning is the sort of stuff that everybody has in their little corner that everybody would love to listen into. And that's like the human side of the industry. And I think as a as a retailer to have the foresight to go, well, this is something special that you can't just get anywhere in the world. It says something about the retailer, actually. And then that for me is part of, I think, if you're thinking forward, 
you know, rather than it being a versus thing, why not say, well, we've got this strength, we've got these opportunities, we do this, if we put it all together, we could do this amazing thing, which would be amazing for the consumer, which is sort of the point. So, um, yeah, I think it's a very forward thinking, forward thinking approach, actually. And I think, you know, there, there is a big difference also, and most of you were here for the first panel uh, today, and, and, and you saw someone like Mohamed Siddiqui, you can feel, I mean, he's breathing watches. I mean, he even said he's sleeping with his watches, so. <laughs> uh, whereas you compare that to XYZ group, who's only thinking in the morning is, did we reach target this month? One is very short-term oriented, one is really passionate about what he's doing and what he's selling. And, and, and again, the end consumer will, will recognize that at one point of a time. I mean, uh, Moser has been very successful uh, as well by being unique in their communication uh, approach while being extremely uh, innovative. And, and I think they got a, a great consumer engagement. Uh, I think, honestly, independence are, are, are I would say, key words in, in today's uh, future for the, the watchmaking industry and uh, being creative and embrace the change. I mean, uh, don't go against the, the wave, just swim with the wave and, and just bring maybe new ideas and creative ideas to, to make a statement and position yourself in a, in a different way so that you can compete against what you were asking me. Yes, brands are, are selling more and more direct to the end consumer, uh, but that shouldn't mean it's the end of the retailer. Mm. So do we, are we, from my side for the panelists um, and it's interesting because we do have brand representatives there as well do you think it's the brands that are guilty of the misrepresentation between blogging influencers and reach and if brands in the audience want to answer that question please feel free to do so sorry Malika say that again um, I just want to know is it are the brands guilty of the misconception between influencer and reach? Because we're here talking, uh, going back to what Christoph said earlier, is that we shouldn't really, um, uh, you know, have this misconception that influencers, or as we know it today, are actually selling. Um, what we like to call is reach. So someone with X number of followers is just exposing the brand to their reach, whereas someone with maybe five followers is actually influencing purchases. So the misconception that exists today in the world of influencing or blogging, are the brands guilty of that misconception or is it the consumer or is it a collective force? I think it's up to you. <laughs> um, I work uh, with Dario, I'm the marketing manager of D1 Milano. So uh, since I've been working with influencers for quite uh, like three or four years, which is basically my whole work experience, uh, what I can tell you is that, yes, it's true that brands uh, now use influencers who has a high reach, so a high number of followers. And I think that this actually does work for a brand like ours that wants to communicate to a lot of people because, of course, uh, we are talking about uh, affordable watches, so uh, we need to talk to a lot of people that have the purchasing power to, to buy those watches. I think yesterday we were talking to Fiona, which is a completely different case. Her brand wants to talk to a completely different audience, so maybe for her it would be uh, like uh, it would be false to think that if she talks to through influencers that have millions of followers, she will reach the, the correct uh, client because she needs a niche. So she needs influencers that are influencers in the term of maybe they are artists in a, in a small circle or uh, they have a voice uh, in, a, in a small circle of people. So um, what I think is that who in, the real question is uh, who you want to influence. So wh who is your target? Uh, so, of course, for the one Milano, we, we actually need, and it's not a misconception, that we do need people who, who have a higher reach. But that is not all, of course. Like, we cannot stop to that. No, but they're not influencing people to buy. 
I think in the end for us they are influencing people to buy our watches. So actually this year we focused a lot on Italy and we saw that our audience and our traffic grew by 20-25% uh, only in Italy and that was the market we are focusing on. So we can see a direct connection between the use of influencers in a certain country and how actually the traffic and the, the sales are going into that country. So for a brand like ours it's... Uh, important unfortunately if i can to add to them. that like at the end of the day uh, if you're talking about it depends on the brand you're talking about we're talking about hundreds of thousands of watches that you have to sell for per year if you're talking about for example the royal oak they sell around 30,000 pieces if you're talking about bespoke i think a couple of thousands will make for it so obviously having a bigger reach depending on the type of like brand you're having will influence like purchases but it's very easy nowadays to understand if a blogger even with a high reach is a fake influencer a blogger like an, a player NBA player an Instagram influencer because you have a lot of analytics that help you mm -hmm. so I think if a brand uh, positions its resources on influencers that don't influence a brand they're stupid because you have like analytics you have uh, the yes. engagement you have on Instagram you have the tools for Facebook ads so Nowadays, brands should keep good, like they should know how to use these resources to evolve like their marketing uh, like uh, activities in an efficient way. And if they don't, I think that's up to brands. It's true, like a lot of brands, like they, they, inf like, uh, they start uh, promoting with influencers that we know for sure don't like give any value whatsoever, not only in purchasing, but also maybe in brand awareness. Because yet again, like influencers, can influence a consumer to buy. Maybe somebody with like 2,000 followers can influence a lot of people to buy, but his reach is very small. And if you need to raise your brand awareness, maybe that's that kind of like particular profile doesn't apply. And that, that actually is a term, they're called micro influencers. Am I, am I correct on that? No, there is yeah. a term, but it was legitimately. They're called micro influencers. And actually they, had, they, they wind up being a bit more substantial. Right, which, which is, is the yes, completely. But that's not just brands. Trade shows call them bloggers. I can't tell you how many times I go and speak at, you know, in Vegas at, at Couture or JCK, and, you know, they're like, oh, we have we have a bunch of bloggers in the, in the community, and it's like three of them are standing there. None of them have websites. None of them write, and so they have now called themselves microbloggers because they're looking at no, no, no. I write, but I write her name much smaller scale in a little <laughs> tiny screen on my phone. It's a free, I mean, good on them. They've made successful careers out of a free app. Oh my God, they're geniuses. They're geniuses. We all go to school and, and learn craft. And they are making, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in some cases, off of a free phone app. It's amazing. Is that because the brands are actually paying that? I don't think the brands help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't think the brands help at all. They need to make a conscious decision that to support the right community who's either going to bring them the reach or bring them the, the right type of right. influencer. Yeah, so obviously, it's part, I think it's responsibility of the brand. But yet again, like, as the, the industry is evolving, obviously, you see like some kind of bloggers that don't have that. There's a lot of like watch bloggers that I don't believe have that much of a connoisseur about watch making in general. They have like two or three photos, they do some nice photos, but they have a big influence. And w what is like the responsibility of the brand is to, I think, go and, and grasp the consumers that like will go and appreciate your brand. Whatever the type of uh, strategy it is, obviously it has to be in line with your ideals, but bloggers is not a, like a kind of definition we gave as brands. I think it's something that evolved naturally, and now it's part of like the industry's like uh, definition of it. But you should differentiate, and I think there is a differentiation between blogger, which is an Instagram blogger, and some. I don't. An editorialist is completely different. I think it's completely mm. different uh, definition of it. Mm. Well, edi editor editorial. I mean, editorialist is editorial, <coughs> and there are those are few and far between. Advertorialists are all over the joint. 
there okay, is I'm a sorry. difference I with wanna, that too. I want to comment because, um, so I'm the Chief Marketing Communication Officer at Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons, and we deal directly with our customers. The brand doesn't deal with the clients, not all the brands. Today there are brands that are that have their own stores and they deal with the, with the clients directly. But we're the ones who face the backlash from loyal clients if the brand chooses the wrong influencer. Because you can lose a very loyal client That's just valid. because you tied up with the wrong influencer. So today, when we sit with the brands, and that's what Christophe said, the problem is it's a copy-paste. You take something and you copy-paste it and you think it's going to work all around the world. But that's not true. Each region, each country has a different way of reaching to the, to the consumer. So today we have to fight battles with 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 the, with the brands and say, listen, you want to talk to my client, okay? You have to do it our way, and they want real people. So so this the last week we launched a campaign with with Chopard, and we used only real women from the region, from the GCC, and the, the feedback we received was amazing, Extremely. incredible, compared to another campaign we had with the same brand, but we used influencers and. The feedback was negative. Why is this influencer wearing this piece? Because she's wearing it, I don't want to buy it. So they need to be conscious about this. It doesn't work for all the brands. And the copy-paste concept that all the brands are doing, some of them say, but, uh, but that brand is doing it, and I have to do the same. No. Do what your brand needs. Mm -hmm. So if what you're doing for uh, D1 Milano is working, good for you. you know? Just listen to your consumers, and if it's working, it works. But if it doesn't generate sales at the end of the day or interest, you're doing it wrong. And don't just go jump on the bandwagon because right. ten other brands are doing it. But this is the um, this is like the Kalashnikov effect. <clears throat> People think that if they have a zillion likes, friends, followers, that <clears throat> that is going to have a positive reaction in selling a particular product. What Darius said is. Right, you don't have to do that. It doesn't make sense anyway because you have the statistics, you have the analytics, you can work out who your who your end consumer is, what which market actually works for you. The idea of just uh, piggybacking on somebody because they actually have a great following does not necessarily work. It can do depending on what the product is, but in a market like your your own, what you did was an intelligent, constructive. Um, fo focused uh, approach. So I mean, what you said, it's like every, every market has a slight difference. The products are, you do have products which cross over boundaries, but a lot of products don't. And even if you have one brand, different products within one brand can actually appeal to different markets yeah. as well. That can be down to material, that can be down to complication, that can be down to size, that can be down to an element of, of artistry, uh, a certain bling essence or a lack of it. The same kind of product that sells in Japan, uh, a small uh, classical style piece, will sell in Vietnam if you add a diamond to it, literally to a winding crown. And then that actually just, it just twists it slightly, but you couldn't reverse it. You can't take the product which was selling sell in Vietnam and then sell it in Japan. So you still have to be very conscious to the, the, the individual markets and the customers within them. I think there, uh, there is, a, oh. if I may just jump in and... Uh, yeah. There's another factor that we, we haven't been speaking is also the, the loyalty of influencers to brand. You know? And that's why I said earlier, select your influencers because they share your value and they are actually passionate about your product or brand because they're not just going to jump on the next bandwagon because another brand is offering more money. So you as a consumer, one day you see X wearing brand Z, a month later the same person is wearing brand X right. that you actually hate. So what's then your connection to the product and the influencer? And so the, the loyalty is, is very important because you can just lose customers uh, by representing too many brands in a short period of time. Sure. Then consumer will not understand the, the message anymore. So the... I, I am so sorry. We are completely over time. So if you guys have any questions, I'm sure the four of these kind people uh, will be available throughout the day and, and likely tonight too. So thank you very much for your patience. Thanks for, for being here. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you speakers, our speakers. Uh, there's tea and 
you know, coffee in the other room. So please feel free to go refresh yourself there.